but um, okay, wait a second, right. Um, okay, so we're gonna start. I'm gonna put you guys up there. And this is the first Friends of Tracking, um, well, course or uh, introduction to what we're doing. And I'm David Sumter. Nice to meet you all. I've got nice pictures here of when I do this. I'm a bit of an amateur. There we go. I've got nice pictures here of who the Friends of Tracking are who are online this evening. Um, what I'm going to ask them to do is just one by one, give a brief introduction to what their role is, who they are, what their role is, uh, what club they work for, and so on. So I'll start with Xavier. We'll, um, yeah, just go ahead, Xavier. Yeah, thanks, David. Well, I, I, I work right now at Barcelona. Uh, basically, I'm the head of, of sports analytics group. Um, I started there, I think, is almost four or five years ago now. And I think a common topic that uh, comes that we were probably going to talk about that is, uh, you know, the one man band nature. So that's basically how I started there. But then uh, now we have a small team and basically um, are in charge on trying to uh, try to take the tactical analysis side of the club and trying to provide information for coaches and analysts. Yeah. Cool. OK, we'll go over to um, Suds then. Um, I'll spotlight you so you can uh, say a little bit about yourself. Awesome. Thank you, David. Um, thank you, everyone else, for watching, uh, whoever is here right now. Uh, my name is Sudarshan Gopaladesikan. It's quite a mouthful, so I learned very early to go by the name of Suds. Um, I've, uh, right now, I'm the head of sports data science at uh, Benfica uh, in Lisbon, Portugal. And uh, we have about a team of uh, me plus four other people uh, focusing not just on tactical analysis, but tactical analysis, load monitoring, uh, neurocognition, strength and conditioning, and uh, injury risk factors. Uh, we've been a team for about two years and still learning every day. Cool. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, next, I'll go over to you, Fran. So I'll put you on the spotlight. There you go. Yeah. So I'm Fran Peralta. I started working with uh, Hammarby, a football club in Sweden, in Stockholm, uh, since a few months uh, full time. But I did my master's thesis there together with, with you, with David. And uh, well, it's just pretty much just us in the team in, uh, of analytics in Hammarby. And we pretty much focus on uh, opposition analysis and, um, and tactical analysis of our team and pretty much with uh, combining tracking data and event data to do this work. Cool, and then finally, we'll go over to uh, Pascal. Hey, I'm Pascal. I work as a data scientist for the German Football or Soccer Association, and I work kind of two heads there. One is uh, supporting the national team coaches and teams with uh, tactical analysis based on data, but also with workload stuff. And the other head is supporting other departments like our talent identification and development part with some helpful data insights. Cool, thanks a lot. So what I'll do now is I'll just say a few housekeeping things. So please write any comments you want in the, well, in the comment section on the YouTube channel. I think that's the best place to put them. Then what I'll do is I'll collect them up during the meeting and ask the guys a few questions that come from you. So if you want to have a chance to ask some questions. Otherwise, we're going to, what we're going to do today is, is just talk a little about, bit about what the idea is with this YouTube channel and the course we're going to try and run. And then we're also going to answer the question that we all get asked the most really, I think, is like, how do you become a data scientist for a football club? How do you, what, what are the skills you need and what, what should you do? But before we we'll do that, I think we should look at, I think Friends of Tracking is a very strange name, I think, for, for many people who aren't familiar with it. And um, I also thought it was a bit funny to use exactly this name, but um, I've been in this WhatsApp group for half a year or so called Friends of Tracking. And I've never really, actually my, myself, I've never really understood what the 
what the background is to that name. So what we're actually going to start with is a little description from the other guys, I think Suds and Pascal in particular, about how Friends of Tracking came about. So if I can share my screen again, I can go over to PowerPoint. And whoop. So maybe maybe just before we, before we go over to like what's friends of tracking yeah well I'll put I'll put this slide up and I'll just ask Suds and Pascal explain a little bit about the history behind how friends of tracking came about and then building up to the aims that you guys had. Hey yeah um, I can start so uh, this initiative actually was started a couple of years back. Um, by some key people of organizations that are being represented here today. Um, so uh, from Benfica side, it was Pedro Marquez, who is our uh, technical director of the academy. Uh, from Javier side, I believe it was Raul. Uh, I don't know how to say his last name. So please chime in Javier if you can correct me there. And then from Pascal side, it was uh, Christoph Clemens, who I believe is the head of match analysis. And this was when optical tracking data um, getting the XY position of the players on the field was starting to become a reality. Um, maybe not as commercial as it is today, but uh, they understood that there could be value to be gained from this, uh, looking at um, examples being done in the NBA, in basketball, in baseball, and, and so forth. And so um, this initiative was first created by them. It kind of didn't go anywhere because uh, they were a bit too high level or too executive to figure out, okay, well, we're not going to be the ones working with the tracking data that is produced. Um, and it then was kind of recreated uh, by, by all of us. Um, I decided to reach out to Javier and uh, the rest of the people here um, when one of our old uh, head of performance gave me an idea. Um, he said, and I think this is a great idea that anyone should try to adopt in any uh, industry or any job that you guys work in, and that was to kind of move away from the standard times of when people get to collaborate across organizations, so conferences or uh, this, um, but actually, you know, invite people over to an Airbnb place, um, have the focus be more on, you know, eating good food, drinking good wine, uh, but also make sure that uh, there was an entire day's worth of lectures and seminars where people from the industry could actually exchange ideas. Um, unfortunately, probably we can't be congregating like that at the moment due to what's happening in the world. So, but uh, hope can I, I just say something because I think it might be it might be quite surprising to a lot of people who are outside this world that there is sort of friendly collaboration between clubs. Um, we're not like terrible rivals in every aspect. I think I think it's, it's, it's interesting to say a little bit more about that, that it wasn't, it isn't just you guys that were friendly in this way, but it's also the technical directors at the various clubs who are, who are open to these types of things. I think I would leave that for Javier to speak about the innovation hub around that. Yeah, um, I think that uh, it's, a, it's a good point uh, you can see when you when you ask people in uh, in other sports that have that has like a like a longer uh, history of you know analytics in general and the communication or the sharing between you know clubs and teams and, and stuff is not it's not uh, common or doesn't happen often uh, actually it's, it's quite rare. Um, and basically one opportunity we have in football is that since, Analytics in football uh, basically began a uh, few years ago. You, you might say people have, have been doing things for 10 years, but then uh, everyone sees the importance of, for example, trying to merge tracking data and event data to get some information in terms of tactics and, and, and context. So basically you might have four or five years of advanced analytics in football uh, so we're very far away from, you know, the current state of uh, basketball and baseball and other sports. Um, but still, you see many clubs and I mean, most clubs, and this is probably the conversation we have with, with, with Sots at the beginning and the same thing happened with Alex and many other people that 
clubs and different teams were basically doing the same things uh, separately, right? So something we agreed is that we found out that everyone had the same issues, that, uh, that the idea of bringing analytics into a club or into a team uh, shares very common issues. Uh, everyone was solving them in similar ways, but no one was actually sharing about those common things. So we basically, just to end that, um, start gathering to discuss the common issues and common approaches. And I think they, that it was 85% on soft skills and how do you get things to, mm -hmm. to work within the, you know, the complex environment in a club more than actually the technical implementation of things, which we also cover, but it's basically, I think football has the opportunity to change that perspective, at least for now. I don't know what's going to happen in the next years, but uh, it's important we don't grow as uh, independent silos, right? It's, it's, it's important to try to share because uh, right now the advantage is in coaches, in players, and in, in so on, not 100% uh, not, not on the not numbers. in the analytics. Yeah, cool. Okay, Pascal, then I'll ask you to, because you've made this lovely slide, I'm going to ask you to um, go through the... Um, go through these yeah these i mean slides. sets and and javi mentioned the most important things what what then happened is that sets uh was so invited us all for two days meet up to uh to can learn i just say one thing we're getting some sorry sorry to interrupt you pascal train. we're getting Sorry yeah. to interrupt you we're getting a couple of things yeah. coming through that you should everyone should speak quite loudly if possible so um yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> go for go for some loud speaking. I can do so, that. <laughs> you can do that, Javier. Right. <laughs> it wasn't about you. <laughs> so, I think it was uh, last summer, but less than a year ago now, where we met for two days in Lisbon, and we had no agenda or any schedule. We just talked for two days about data, and we came out with some points we'd like to achieve with that group and i think we made it in some way to continue discussing and working on things and those are the points listed here we, we exchanged of course best practices and lessons learned uh for working as a data scientist in soccer we had two participants working for a club two for a federation which was a cool mix uh and, and led to a cool discussion. We tried to share knowledge within our group, but also within the whole analytics community. This is what we're doing right now. Um, we talked a lot about how to legitimize the role of a data scientist and help create pathways for people to work on sports. And with that group, it's a cool position to get into better negotiation with uh, vendors with tracking systems and we have the goal to establish some quality standards some stand metrics and this is all what, what what not really exists in soccer and therefore it makes sense to get with a group of people like this together and try to to achieve the goal and of course based on that meeting there were some uh chosen projects where we collaborate on will do for the future as well cool um, what I, I, I'm going to just say one thing now that uh, please, if you've got some questions for these guys, you can put them into the um, into the YouTube chat. I haven't quite worked out how to interact with the YouTube chat, but I can see a few types of few questions coming in. So um, I'm going to save most of them for the end. And what we're going to do now is talk about what we want to achieve with this course over the next few um, few days. So I'm going to ask um, and share my screen again here and I'm going to ask Javier if he could start talking about this because it really the initiative for the current thing that we're doing now really came from you. I think that you sent us a text on Monday morning. I don't know if you had a revelation on Sunday night or something like that or, or what it was. But anyway, you send a very excited text on Monday morning hmm. saying that you felt we had to give back to the community. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that the good thing is that you, you, you were already thinking about that. And you're basically, I mean, this, this is not something new or this no kind of uh, innovation, because if you basically take a, 
a quite uh, you know a quick look into Twitter. There's many many people from different backgrounds trying to you know to to give back in in these times. And for and giving back for me means that uh, basically right now the world is living you know very very tough moment. Uh, there's a lot of people in homes trying to stay home and be right, but there, there's also people, you know, getting sick and suffering, doing stuff. So uh, it's 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 terrible. And I think uh, what what can be interesting is that um, I mean everyone has something in which they are good or they work on or they can probably you know uh, add some information. And the very beginning of this group was a lot of open source and free information in general, right? Since I mean, like what Pascal said of, you know, trying to uh, talk about uh, typical, I mean, to list papers, to, uh, to, to try to provide um, standards to the industry and, and practically to take this forward. So right now, I think we have uh, the opportunity or of at least trying to share what we, I mean, our, our experience uh, working in particular in football, in football clubs. It's not the same thing working in a football club that in companies, that in, in, in academy and in industry. I mean, uh, I think there are many, many different um, standpoints and we will try to bring as much people as possible to make them join these conversations and trying to get uh, everyone or, or, to, or to share with everyone what's the current state of analytics in football and in particular to listen uh, what people can say or ask, right? I mean, I know, I know there's a lot of things that might, might, might be interesting for people. So if we can provide some information on that uh, regarding of our own experience, I think can be, can be good in this time. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good. The, um, I think that's what we we're gonna say is that the next session we do, probably next Thursday, maybe before if we get very excited about it, um, is we're going to have a Zoom where we're going to see if we can have anybody joining in and get a little bit about, a bit about feedback, what you would like us to do, what things, what types of courses would you like to have, what would be interesting um, yeah, for everybody out there to actually hear more about, because there's things that are interesting to us, but they might not be the things that are most interesting to the community that we're trying to, trying to reach. And so we're going to do a combination of live videos on Thursday evenings. Um, we're also going to do some uploaded material. Um, I think maybe I'm just going to put Suds on the spot there. And he's, you said you're going to work at something at the weekend. And uh, what, what were you going to, you thinking of doing? Uh, well, what I was thinking for doing at the weekend was just uh, speaking about um, work that is being done. That is what we consider the 80% or what is considered operational work. So a work that data scientists can help enhance uh, the job of technical staff um, on a week to week basis, and then also give some insights into what does the 20% look like? What does research and innovation look like? What kind of projects uh, are those? And then um, that would probably set the stage for future videos to then dive deep into actually some of these projects. Cool. And Fran, you what 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 have you been thinking about? I know that normally I'm just telling you various things that I'd like to see done. So yeah. <laughs> don't want to no, interfere uh, with your normal work, of course. But um, in well, my case, I think, think? Uh, I'll pretty much uh, talk about the communication that we have to have with coaches and players on a weekly or daily basis, because like that's one of the main things that we're doing in our club. We have the the luck that we we have like direct communication with coaches and players. So how to show the analytics, how to make them understand them, how they learn from us and we learn from them. Because, well, since we're not football coaches or anything like that, we, we're in this, in this process of continuously learning. So it's like all of this, this uh, learning together with uh, coaches and, uh, and football players. Cool. Um, and then if we just go to Pascal, we haven't actually talked much about what you were... Uh, um, well, I can't just get this focus thing to work just now. Sorry, Pascal. <laughs> My, uh, um, ah. <laughs> um, Actually, yeah, um, I'm, no. I'm going to pass a spotlight you now, Pascal. There we go. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> so, um, Actually, I, I did not really uh, think a lot about what I'm going to do. I'll see what you guys do and then try to provide uh, 
some other interesting stuff. I see we get a lot of questions here, so we should address to them uh, in the following sessions to show the people what they like to see. So we'll yeah. see. <laughs> Say. Good. And then I'll just read through. So one thing I'm going to say here, um, oh, I should focus on myself here. I'll, I'll make myself, um, I'll stop my share and make myself really big. I like to do that. There we go. <laughs> um, one thing that we're going to do is we're going to break the, th the stuff we do down into three different levels. So we're going to do sort of introductory things, and that will be a bit more informal, um, a bit more like what we're doing this evening about how to be a data scientist. Then we're going to do stuff which is the learning. So these will be proper lessons. I've been trying to make up a lesson on expected goals. We've got lessons coming up on pitch control, different sorts of theoretical things. Most of the programming will be in Python. I'm even thinking I was talking to our club technical director today, and I was saying that I'm going to teach him live on YouTube how to install Anaconda. So I think that will be fun. I'm not sure I will manage that task to be absolutely honest, but we're going to try and get him to do it. Actually, I'll get Fran to help me help him do it. Yeah, I can help him with that. <laughs> and um, then we'll also, but we're, we're not, we're going to go like right from the broad, right from the intro to the learning, but also do the research part. So some of the talks will be focused on exactly cutting edge research that we're, we're doing, we're doing today. So all of those aspects will be, um, will be covered. There's a focus on tracking data, of course, because a lot of this thing, these things were um, uh, going to start with tracking data. And then the last thing I think I wanted to say on this list is that, um, unfortunately, there's not going to be any club gossip. You know, now and again, I, I text Xavier and trying to get some gossip out of him at Barcelona, but it never seems to work, actually. So there won't be any club gossip or anything like that on here. It will just be about our day-to-day -day work and the football analytics we do. And when we use the names of football players, it will be because of some sort of stat that we've generated about them. So there'll be, there'll be none of that, I'm afraid. So if you're tuned in for all of that, unfortunately, it's not going to happen. Yeah. I think just I think one, one, oh. Yeah, yeah cool. It sucks. No, no. Go on, please. No, just one quick thing to say is uh, just looking at the questions that are coming through. I think one of the main questions that people want to know is what's it, how is it possible to get a hold of tracking data? So just keep that in mind if we have an answer to that. Um, yes, we have an answer to that too. We're hopefully going to get uh, Swedish tracking data for, for, my, for last season. I was hoping that I might be able to say that we had it confirmed now but it's just, I have to just write a last letter to the Swedish um, league and check that they're really on board to do this. So there will be in various ways, some access to tracking data. It might take a week. I was hoping it would be this evening, but it might take a week or so, but that's definitely our aim. And in any case, there'll be some example tracking data coming out with the things that we do, even if we don't have an entire league. So that's the answer to that one. Um, Javier, you had something? Yeah, very quickly. I was actually going in, in the line of, of what Sots was saying. I mean, just seeing very quickly in the chat, there's, I mean, lots of the topics you, you, you mentioned. I'm, I'm not, covered, go, I'm not going to cover that now because you're probably going to address that in the end, but it's things about tracking data and creating spaces and communicating with coaches, visualization, working with tracking data, merging with physical data, uh what else I, so i mean so many different i mean people asking from i mean about uh the technical aspects of how to get into that and uh, to work with that kind of data and some other people asking about uh how do you actually get to present that so i think this basically more or less on the line we have been uh talking about or or thinking that this could be uh, addressed and it's good to, to, uh, to keep getting comments and suggestions about that because we actually have no uh, a, a specific plan or, or like a fixed plan of what's mm. most important or what's gonna be more relevant or first uh, produced. So yeah, it's good to see that. Yeah, cool. That, that's, that's definitely gonna keep us on our toes that we have to get hold of some tracking data and, and make sure that it's, it's uh, released so that we can do this, do this properly. Um, okay, but let's uh, let's take us then. So we we were the whole idea was we were going to today we're going to talk about um, how can someone become a club analyst and 
what my first question um, was actually how it happened for you. So maybe we'll, um, I kind of know, I don't, the only person's story who I don't know properly is Pascal's story. So I'm going to go over to you, Pascal, and put you on the spot and ask you, yeah. how did you get to end up working for the, the German Football Association? Yeah. Um, I mean, my, my background is I have kind of two blocks within my education. One is that I am a mathematician who worked as data scientist for German research establishment. And on the other hand, I have almost 10 years of coaching experience at a man's team in six, sixth German league, which is not professional, but it gave me at least the perspective of a coach. And I had the chance to do my UEFA a coaching license and I, I did both uh, for a while at the same time main job as a data scientist part job as a coach and then there was that job post from the DFB I applied to get the job and this is a bit more than a year ago now and it's still a dream to combine both of my passions in a full-time job that's my story. Yeah. Can I just pin you down because I'm the mathematician and I'm interested in the educational side of it. What precisely did you do your degree in and um, in what you got your education in? Uh, I both bachelor and master's in applied mathematics and with my master thesis, which was about uh, Matrix factorization, I get the first uh, touch of, of big data because I worked on that uh, Netflix data set, some of you may know, uh, okay. where it was about uh, that the recommendation system challenge was about predict which person may like what film and that was my first contact with data science and big data and uh, yeah th then I went to to that research establishment where I spent most of the time uh, working in industry projects it's a research establishment that is kind of funded partly by by the government and research project and partly by industry projects okay that's yeah great um, then I'll go over to someone whose story I I know pretty well um, Fran can you say a few things about how you got involved with this? Yeah, well, with me, like I'm a physicist. I studied physics in Spain. And after my bachelor's degree, I decided to, to change a bit. So I moved to Sweden to do a master's program in Uppsala, where I met uh, you. I met David there. He was my teacher in, in uh, modeling complex systems. And well, I liked that course. And so I, I asked him to do uh, the master's thesis with him and uh, it turned out to be about football, of course. So we started working with tracking data, collaborating with Javier in Barcelona and with Hammarby here in Sweden. And uh, so after that, I just continued working a bit at the university with, in a project together with Hammarby. And that uh, job that lasted for six months turned out to be like a really long job interview with Hammarby. <laughs> so, <laughs> apparently they really liked what we did there and they decided to, to hire me up. So that was, that's pretty much my story. I can't remember how, how you first approached me. Cause one thing that I find a lot is I get a lot of emails from people saying, I want to be a football analyst, help yeah. me or something like that. And I suppose you've done my course, so I could see your grades. So maybe this doesn't quite apply. <laughs> yeah, um, but but, in, <laughs> but often, case, often I find um, that they're not very well formulated in the sense mm -hmm. that they don't really convey useful information about why you're interested in this type of thing. Did mm -hmm. you? I can't remember what you thought, if you thought about anything before you, you contacted me and asked about a project. Uh, well, the fun thing is that uh, I knew you before I went to Uppsala because I read your book. And okay. You I, told me that, but I didn't believe yeah. you. I didn't, I, I didn't think no, that, that was that true. Was true. <laughs> that was true. And I didn't know that you were a teacher in Uppsala until yeah. I met you in class. Okay. So that was pretty fun <laughs> to see. Like, uh, it was like, yeah, I know this guy. <laughs> I read the book. So now after that, I just, uh, I think I sent you an email like many months before starting the thesis because I knew that you got like a lot of proposals for thesis and all of this. And well, yeah, like he was just uh, asking you for doing something with football. Yeah. 
I was I was thinking actually going over to you, Xavier. I was thinking that it was very interesting for me because when I wrote in Socomatics, one of the first examples I did was about Voronoi diagrams, and I used Barcelona as an example. And then I thought it was fascinating to actually come down and find that you were doing this, but so much better than I'd ever imagined with your pitch control. And I think that's that's really fascinating. How did how did you get into into this? Yeah. I think I, I always say, I mean, this, uh, this question of how, how do you get into a football club and, and do these things is, 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 is pretty common. And uh, there's pretty good recommendations uh, on how to do that. But I think that 90% of the people I know doing that in clubs got there mostly randomly, right? Uh, and for me, it was um, as random as possible. I think my, uh, my wife was in a class in her master's and the, the professor he had was contacted to find a master student to do a thesis in the club. And he was only allowed to, to tell the people within that class. But my wife was there and told me and I, I applied for, the, for an initial position. So it's, it, it's I don't, I'm not sure it can, it can get more random than that. <laughs> but what probably is not random, and that's where the recommendations of what you can do to get there, uh, are good is uh, the kind of skills in terms of you know hard and soft skills um, you might need to do that role, and I think uh, I, I'm I'm not sure actually if that's the, uh, the the next topic we're all gonna talk about. I just wanted to add that um, very quickly that in terms of soft skills, there's many things we can talk about, but in terms of uh, of hard skills, in terms of technology. Uh, it will depend a lot on uh, in what stage of analytics of the club you're entering in the club is. Mm. Maybe the club is just starting and then you need to build everything from scratch and then there's going to be different things you would like to do. Uh, the club, different clubs have uh, different uh, starting initial demands, right? One club can be more focused on player scouting, one other club can be more focused on trying to model uh, a club's you know, game model and so. But something I would like to add is that um, it's not only clubs. I mean, you can work in this from academy uh, in terms of um, universities. Uh, there's lots, lots, lots of companies now uh, that are being established and, or even, you know, being created uh, every year that are doing very interesting things in sports. So um, that's probably a more direct way of playing there. And also working in a football club, it's very, it's very nice for a lot of things, but it's very specific as well in some other things. So you need to like um, lots of noise and pressure and mm -hmm. <laughs> issues with budget and thing that everyone faces. So it, it, it depends on how, how, how you like to work, but I, I think there are many, many ways of actually mm. work in analytics in football right now. It's just starting. So it's a, it's a good moment to enter in this industry, I think. Well, I think you're down to question four on my list now, uh, Xavier. We'll, get, we'll, we'll take uh, Suds back to, um, to question one. How did you get into, um, yeah. into it? Uh to follow into what uh, everyone else was saying. It kind of happened uh, randomly, uh, being at the right place at the right time. Um, I graduated from college, uh, did my bachelor's in math, uh, had a very big interest in real analysis, uh, study of real numbers, and um, but then also had an interest in getting a job out of college. <laughs> so. Because the first time I met you, you started talking about a pure maths problem with me, which I had no understanding whatsoever of what yeah. it was. <laughs> so um, you still, you're like, you consider yourself a proper mathematician or you're interested in proper mathematics. Well, it was just uh, my, my background was, I think it's something that we will talk about later, but the background was no programming. It was really, you know, mm. whiteboard, like uh, doing proofs on the whiteboard, mm. more uh, textbook and uh, pen and paper type stuff. Mm. So when I got my job at Microsoft, uh, it was actually with a tool that many people might be familiar with was uh, Power BI. So I was um, one program manager of Power BI before what it is today, when it was uh, transitioning out of Excel and uh, becoming its own product. And so there was a very lucky period because, because Power BI was not yet a mature uh, product. I was a new employee to Microsoft. So my leadership said, you know, um, 
do whatever you want, but just really push push what we have right now, push Power BI to the limits. Uh, so it was the year of 2014, the World Cup was happening at that time. Um, so I decided to scrape some data. We bought some Opta data as well on World Cup and just uh, built some analysis around that and tested out um, how Power BI works against a soccer data set. Mm. Um, during this time, uh, Microsoft was also lining up a uh, technical or technology partnership with Real Madrid. And somehow what I was doing got uh, caught wind of someone working on the project with Real Madrid. Sorry, Javier. Um, <laughs> that's how we ended up starting to work with uh, Real Madrid. And um, through that, Microsoft thought that uh, we thought that we could maybe develop a athlete management system within Microsoft built on Azure. Um, and then that's how we then worked with multiple different clubs and also multiple different sports. Uh, it was only maybe two years in that uh, one person, my boss right now, and me, we had this realization that it was good to work uh, with the club as a third-party vendor, as Microsoft, but the progress that we probably could have made if uh, there was someone dedicated to data science uh, from the data engineering perspective, from the visualization perspective, and the modeling perspective, uh, if there was someone actually native in-house to develop that, uh, progress would probably be made faster instead of just waiting on Tuesday, Thursday sync calls with some someone from Microsoft who has other responsibilities other than just working with one club. Um, so to boss, he said, you know what, uh, I'm going to take a gamble on you uh, and uh, let's see if we can build something internally. And that's how I'm, I'm here today. Cool. That's a lovely story. Um, what, I'm, what I was thinking about now is the next one, next question came up because I um, did an interview, this was a while ago, this was a year ago with Luke Bourne, who is Javier's PhD supervisor and a big influence in all forms of analytics. And he confessed to me that he had only a sort of mild interest in sport. He wasn't really that interested in sport but then when he got access to all the data that you could have in sport, that was what really inspired him. So my next question is a kind of controversial one. Are you all big football fans? Um, who will I start with? Javier seems, uh, are you a massive Barcelona fan? And this is your dream come true to work with your childhood club. Yeah, I mean, uh, actually, I came to realize that when I, when I was, I think, uh, 10 years old, I said that um, my dream job was to do AI for football. And my <laughs> idea was to do that for, you know, FIFA game of e EA Sports. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how being a child, uh, the AI or football, or the, the <laughs> fut football side, I know, but the AI part came. It was just probably something I heard. Uh, but then uh, the, in, the curious thing is that I, I studied computer science and then did a master in, a, in, a, in AI, now, now, now doing the PhD and so on. And uh, when I started programming, uh, when I was 15, I think every application I did was in football, uh, <laughs> like, uh, like a simulator of the, uh, La Liga in which uh, you know, different teams have different weights and you basically randomly simulate it and then you get more or less accurate uh, uh, you know, uh, scoreboards and so on. So, uh, but, but the thing is that I never re realized that this could be done uh, in real football in real life. So mm. beyond, I actually love football and have watched football my, my, my whole life. Um, I think it is important to be a football fan, but more importantly, to really try to understand the sport and hear about the experts about that. Because I think David is laughing because probably I jumped to a next question. No, no, I'm laughing because Corey Pace says that Xavier is the real football, real hero here. And uh, <laughs> you're inspiring people. <laughs> yeah. I, no, but no, it's, it's really, that's really nice. Yeah, and uh, I mean, in that line, I was thinking that someone told me there that, uh, Javier, can you please um, speak louder? I think it's the first time in my life that someone <laughs> asked me that instead of speaking lower. So thank you for that. Uh, no, no, really, uh, the thing is that um, 
interestingly, I, 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 I didn't realize that I was actually doing, doing that when I, I got to do, you know, some computer science stuff as, as hobby. I always applied that to football, but I did, really didn't pursue that. Uh, mm. because it came randomly as I as I just mentioned but I guess that having interest in the game and um, the nice thing is that you might find that while you're working you basically don't don't feel like working uh, but then uh, it's important not to assume that you know everything about the game which is pro- pro- probably just five percent of that I think that experts in different sites from coaches of I mean, main coaches, physical coaches, tactical game analysts, and so on, um, can teach you a lot of what is important about football. But if you don't get about, I mean, I imagine myself trying to do analytics in, I don't know, uh, cricket, and I have no idea about the game. So um, if you know mm-hmm. about the game, you're going to come up with uh ideas or features or information that might be useful to get you to the to to the door and also when you speak uh people is gonna know that you have watched football and understand what you're talking about otherwise it becomes a little bit i mean it's not that um that is or that easy to talk yeah okay good um i'm just gonna press this button does that can everyone can we see us all now that's really good look at that that's master of uh, technology there. I think we'll see if it works on the YouTube as well. Uh, now we can see everybody. Now you actually have to look while Javier is talking. You can't look away. Um, no, that's, uh, but just to briefly with you other guys, it sounds like you actually are, and, and I'm not sure this is totally representative, but you are all big football fans from the beginning. Pascal, you said you were a trainer and that, you find that helps you with what you do. Uh, I'm I'm definitely not that crazy than Javi. When I was 10 years old, I wanted to be a professional soccer player. That was that was the plan, and I had no idea that I'm going to do something with math and data science. But uh, yeah, it brought me kind of into that. What I I think whether you like it or not, when you work as a soccer data scientist, you need to understand the game. And you need to understand a lot of processes around the pitch. So a bit of an interest is important. And what, what I know from, from a lot of match analysts and data scientists is that the workload, especially in a club with that weekly daily business, um, is above average. And the salary may not be above average. So mm. a bit of passion for, for the thing you're doing or the stuff you're doing um, definitely helps uh, to be a, a data scientist in soccer, I'd say. Yeah. Cool. Sods? Uh, yeah, for sure. I was, uh, I was, I am, I will be a huge fan of football and a huge okay. fan of sports. Um, I think for me, my entry point into football was um, uh, growing up in, growing up in Pennsylvania in, in the U.S. Uh, I was um, one of very few very few brown brown person there or one of the very few Indians there in my school. Uh, and actually I found football as a way to connect with people and to meet people and to overcome challenges as a group, but also to overcome challenges as an individual. And mm. uh, I think football has taught me a lot about life and cool. it's something that I would like to contribute back to. Okay, cool. And Fran, did you, because you did this project with me, but did, did it have to be a football project you did and data science and physics with football or could it have been something else? Uh, yeah, well, for me, like as everybody else, I've always liked football and I've been always been a football fan. Like I remember going to watch my team Granada in third division in Spain when there were like 100 people in the stadium and having my season ticket for many years. So after I did physics, I mean, I wasn't even planning to work with something related with football. I was just a football fan. But uh, this uh, opportunity came and that was like, uh, of course, I wanted to take it. But I think this is more like as in every wor- as in every job in the world, like you have to like what you do, because if not, you're going to be hitting your life for eight hours a day for the rest of your life. Hmm. So you certainly have to have to like football and mainly because sometimes you're a football fan and then your team is going to play this useless league 
first round uh, first round uh, cup game against a team that is much worse than you and you don't want to watch it but when you work for that club then you probably have to watch that match not only once but twice or three <laughs> <laughs> so you have to like football if you if you want to to do this and, and yeah. so one one yeah. thing that um, is the case that Hammerby, which is is mm. probably unique compared to some of the other clubs, is that we actually have we sit and eat lunch at the same table as the players, and we see them on a daily basis when they're at work. And yeah. so I find I find that very strange often because they're sort of the heroes on the pitch. They're there in front <laughs> of thirty thousand people at our home arena, and then they're just yeah. normal people as well. Exactly, and I think that also has to do, especially here in Sweden, with uh, the. the the kind of life that people live, like nobody's better than anyone. And it doesn't matter if they earn like 10 times more than you. Like you just eat with them and sit with them and talk to them. And they're just people like you. Most of them are even younger than you. And uh, it's like, just as if we were maybe not friends, but like good colleagues, like as, mm. as equal people, yeah. Cool. Okay, we'll move on from the personal perspective and we'll get on to my next question. So. And Javier's gone a little bit into this. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll go over and start with Pascal on this one. What do you think the skill sets are? You've, you've got this hackathon going on just now, uh, for yeah. example. And what do you think the skill sets are for a great data scientist? Yeah, maybe I'd like to start referring to some questions. A lot of people yeah, yeah, are sure, asking it's how, like... to get, how to get data. <laughs> You should have applied to our hackathon where you get two full seasons of <laughs> Bundesliga data, but you're a bit late now for this. Um, re regarding the skill set, I'd say it really depends on the team uh, or the people that are working around you. What I can say that you need for a successful data science project or a data science team competencies or expertise is in uh, computer science, in mathematics, statistics, going to machine learning and a lot of domain expertise, again, understanding the sport. And it is often hard for one piece in, um, to bring all of this, but in case you don't have all these competencies, you need to work in a team and be able to communicate with the other people that have those competencies. So for example, if you have a data literate practitioner within your staff could be a match analyst or assistant coach who is dedicated for the communication to coaches and players you may be able to focus a bit more on the data side of things but if you are the one who needs to communicate things to coaches this is maybe the most crucial um, skill for a data scientist it doesn't matter if your model is 10 percent less accurate than the others if you are not able or more accurate than the others if you are not able to communicate it to a coach. So I would say that communication part is um, the most crucial uh, um, competency for, for a data scientist. Unless or except you have one guy who's dedicated for this, what is usually in a lot of basketball clubs, that there is one communicator who takes the stuff from the data science department and communicates it to the coaches. So cool. we've got a lot of questions coming in about like what type of degree you should do and what kind of qualifications. Uh, just summarize here we've got basically got two mathematicians one pure mathematician one applied mathematician javier did artificial intelligence and computer science as your degree and fran did physics as his degree and it was a question came up actually about physics saying that um some clubs are asking for physics as a background do you think physics is essential you've got the physics background is physics essential for football uh, i wouldn't say it's essential but i think Physics in general makes uh, life super easy to find a job because what people look for is people that can solve problems that they've never faced before. And that's what basically they train you in physics. I mean, of course, they show you like pure science. But uh, when you study physics, you should be able to solve things that you've never seen and just solve them by yourselves with the tools that they, that they give you. So either the physics or mathematics is this kind of solving problems uh, background that many companies and football clubs look for. And um, I'm going to, uh, there's one question here. I'm going to, I'm going to land, I'm going to land Javier in this one. There was a question here. No, now I've, I've lost exactly the one, but it basically said, um, if you don't have this physics, maths or computer science background, are you out of the game? Do you have to have that background to get into it? 
Yeah, it's a it's a it's a good point. I mean, when I when I think about uh, what we talk about the soft skills and the hard uh, the hard skills is that um, actually what I think that is interesting about sports um, analytics in general is that. Uh, you can actually apply the, you know, the whole spectrum of data science as it is supposed to be, right? So one, one may, main issue you have in the world now is that, you know, that idea of unicorns in data science, so basically asking one person to be like a magic person that's able to be good in, in communication, visualization, programming, modeling, thinking. So. Uh, the interesting thing about football is that uh, either you're doing it by yourself or with the team, or you basically need that uh, to be done because you have to start first from, from one question that matters to someone. You just cannot solve something because it's, uh, you can publish a paper on that or be, because it's a long known problem. It has, has to be, I mean, someone has to have, has to have interest in that problem in that moment. And you need to go through a pipeline in which you're going to get lots of bouncing back of trying to get a solution for that problem. So what I was thinking is that definitely the first thing you will need to have if you are uh, in a club or a company that is just starting and doesn't have like a full team already assembled is that you will, be, you, you will need to produce. You'll need to produce things. So having a physics, mathematics, computer science degree uh, will help in terms of that uh, people having those degrees typically are trained to produce through, for, for, for example, programming things um, based on data or based on digital things that you can basically put there. That's good, but uh, it's better not to think on the degree itself, but on being able to produce something, right? To actually go from the question to say, okay, I have come computed this for a whole season or for a whole batch and I, I can do something better or not better, but have, uh, provide a different approach from the experts of football you all, already have watching that. So it has to be different in some sense. I, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull you up a bit because I think that I think that you do need to have those sort of mathematical skills in some sense that it's, it's okay, you've got to have ideas, but there's a sort of basic set of statistical tools and mathematical tools that you just can't get away without knowing and we think of them we use them every day and you're not going to get away without without you have to be able to program for example and you also have to be able to think in that sort of mathematical and statistical way yeah that's true i mean uh for that sense that will definitely help but what i'm basically saying is that you don't need to think if i don't have the degree or a, a university is saying, I have, I have done this and I'm, I'm validated mm. for doing that, then I cannot work in sports. Because something that is important and that not always comes with the degree is the idea of really going through a process and trying to work with someone for a different area uh, to solve yeah. a problem, right? So, for example, you might be uh, you no know, super guy in math and, and, and be able to do in terms of computer science um, um, amazingly complex models, but then you might uh, fail to realize that a basic model might solve sufficiently well for the for the person and and the problem that is being stated in one moment, uh, and you're missing that because you want to fully uh, provide all the you know amazing technical skills you have learned. So definitely having um, a scientific mindset, it's important because you're actually trying to put that on the table and to provide uh, a different way of, of adding information. Mm. Um, but what I want to say is that you can always work on that and you can always train on that. But I think it's important Sorry. to really, really train on communicating oh. things. Uh, I mean, a good training will be uh, try to talk with someone that is not from your area. That is, if you're a computer scientist, that is not a computer scientist, that is an artist, and try to explain something that you do. So if you see people, you know, cl cl closing the eyes or, or getting uncomfortable in five minutes, then you see you need to train that skill because that's probably what's going to happen when you speak with someone in the football world. And that yeah. is beyond of the of the actual technical skill. That, I think that we're going to come back to that a little bit in the soft skills thing. So I was trying to get I've, by just simply placing his picture in the middle of the thing. I was trying to get suds into the uh, into the picture a little bit. <laughs> um, I mean, you're you're. 
I was impressed this idea because you're you're a pure mathematician originally and you couldn't even program a computer actually when you started working on this. So so there is some hope there. Yeah, I think uh, I think to complement what's been said, the the important thing to know is depending if you do enter into a club or if you enter into a startup company or a company that works in uh, football analytics, uh, the most important thing to identify is um, are there any low hanging fruits left to pick? Uh, so to understand that while the topics of this course and while the topics of things we will discuss in the coming weeks will be more around uh, programming uh, tracking data or optical tracking data, I think it's very important to understand that uh, the people that we are producing work for or the, the livelihoods that we are trying to enhance, um, they, they really would be happy with very simple things done correctly and done consistently. Uh, and that does not necessarily require a very advanced mathematics or physics or computer science mm. degree. Um, some simple data wrangling in either Python or R, uh, some simple visualization and being very good at Power BI or Tableau could be a very good starting point. And effectively, it could help you buy time for you to then learn other skills that might be necessary. Um, from the mathematics perspective, what I think is the most helpful thing from my education or uh, things that are important to read about is uh, understanding uncertainty and understand and explaining variance. Um, one very important thing is uh, trying to build a model or build some sort of analysis and really explaining to a coach uh, what is the source of the data, what sample was used, um, how much uh, variance can we uh, explain and how much variance is not explained, mm. especially between group and within group or like within a subject or within player and between player uh, variability. I think that uh, is a very important concept to understand so that mm. uh, uh, coaches can have a good understanding of team analytics, individual analytics, um, but if I had to put forth uh, opinion in the hat, I would say that uh, there is plenty of low hanging fruit out there. And maybe that could even be one video topic to just explain how much low hanging fruit there is to show value of data science within a club without needing to um, do uh, point particle modeling or uh, Bayesian analysis or things like that. Uh, yeah, I think because I wanted to follow up on this because there's a couple of questions coming in. Reese Triple A said, "What is the best resource for getting a greater understanding of statistics and mathematics without doing a degree?" There's a great course I think called Data8.org, and it's run by Berkeley, and it really goes from the basics of data science. From it, so it teaches you both programming and data science at the same time. So there's, I'll put up a link later. Data8.org, it's called. So if you search on that. And that, and it also tries to balance is exactly those types of skills you were saying, Suds, about what you can explain with a model. So I think somebody who's actually done that course is like, it's sort of the equivalent of a first year undergraduate course in statistics, but it combines the programming as well. It's really nice course to, and it has nothing to do with football, but a lovely course for starting those types of things. And I often recommend that as a, as a starting place for, for any of this type of thing. Okay, got, so I'm gonna- I got one thing. I think um, one thing yeah, yeah, sure. to this, I, there were two questions about what, what can people do if they have a sports science background. I mm. know other people with sports science background that use kind of websites to teach coding, but to teach themselves to code and who work now in a, in a, uh, at a soccer club as a data scientist. And there is one qu a request for a book recommendation and maybe you don't want to do it, uh, David, but David wrote two, at least two cool books about <laughs> soccer data analytics, which <laughs> I could recommend. So, soccer matics. <laughs> I think, the question, yeah, I mean, sorry. I'm not to, I, I'd certainly, of course, you should read soccer matics. It's lovely to read, but I'm not sure it's going to give you the skills that you really need directly. What it's going to give you is sort of inspiration and ideas about how you model things. What you definitely still need, I think, is some of these basic courses for for, for the skills um, for doing them. So, yeah, now I'm just talking down. I'll, I'll go back to you, Pascal, because I'm just going to start talking down about soccer matters. No, that <laughs> but that, that's really good. Yeah. I wanted to add very, 
quickly on top of what Pascal said, um, it, is, it, it is possible and it, there is many ways for people that have a background on sports science or, or, or coaching to actually get into that because there's different levels in which you can get. I mean, you don't have to become uh, mainly a data analyst, but it's good to understand uh, up to what point you can get through the data. So we have, for, for example, one case, there's a physical coach. Well, the physical coaches at the club are very, very bright and they're very dedicated in trying to learn a lot. But there's a, a specifically one person that is in charge of uh, analyzing lots of, I mean, a huge part of the physical data that um, we met four years ago and he told me, yeah, I'm interested in, you know, learning how to program. I don't know how to program. I'm a, I'm a coach. Uh, I'm, I'm an expert in, uh, in the physical side, but I want to, to have some knowledge on that. So I gave him a book, uh, but really thinking that, well, that was going to just stay there because, well, it's, you need to do a lot of things if you want to, to start program. Four years after, um, he showed me day by day uh, how can you can really become or have those hard, uh, hard skills coming from a different background. And it's interesting because he has an amazing um, methodology or and, and also you know the mindset of working every day half an hour or one hour. And so he was basically following online courses and trying to, and now he, he knows how to program in R, knows how to program in Python, but more importantly, understands uh, the basics and more advanced things of how to model on top of data. And the good thing is, and this is when, when it comes interesting, is, is that he, since he has uh, knowledge on the applied side, mm. uh, he has lots of fun making those courses. I mean, something I always tell to, uh, to people that is starting to program but comes from a different background is uh, when you have any, any, any uh, subject on computer science or data science or so on, try to take it to a field that you like. Try to get some data from some things that you like because you're gonna have this, you know, you're learning a database modeling and they're gonna tell you, this is a university and students have grades and grades and you really don't, don't care about that. So if you can shift that uh, towards, um, you know, towards sports or towards something that you like, it's a good way of trying to learn. So I just, learned that from experience of seeing him doing that and now has an i mean i always tell him he if he wants he can work as a data scientist a scientist in some other company and no one will know that he comes uh initially from a oh, that's a fantastic fantastic story i mean I, I say to a lot of people that yeah there was a couple of things came into my head one is uh, exactly following up on this idea of having your own project, something that you're interested in. That's that's something I do. My son's 14 and I try and teach him programming on that basis that he has something that he's interested in. Another thing is um, scraping data. Quite a lot of people have been in. A bit controversial for us who are actually all working for organizations that pay for their data. But it isn't that difficult to scrape the data that you need for various projects. There is one particular website. I'm not sure if they still do it but they leave a lot of data very, very unprotected and open, which is easy to get access to. So I'm not going to say what it is, but there was one and when I started doing this where it was actually reasonably easy to just download um, event data from them. So there is places to get started from. And if you can't manage to do that, then there's places like Transfer Marked. And the, and the point there is you get some code which scrapes the data for you. Don't try and learn how to scrape data. Find the code which scrapes certain types of data. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't even go to scrape. I mean, uh, you have uh, so sources like um, um, Stats data that is, yeah. that, mm -hmm. that is there. I think is is, is an amazing kind of data set. So it, it's it's perfect to start doing things. The thing is that we have we have this tendency probably of saying like, yeah, uh, it's not the the same fun if I'm not seeing you know. Messi's name in that data, and and the truth is that when you're modeling, you're not seeing players' name. You're trying to model an yeah. an actual problem. Actually, seeing players' name might actually get you to uh, to add some bias or noise when you're trying to model. So, it's it's even good to have a different uh, kind of of data. And I think it's we're coming back to the data, the, the stats bomb's brilliant, and that's really good. One one data source that people aren't very aware of is that there is a whole season of Y Scout data for the English League, German League, yeah. and so on. Then you can get that. I'm 
I'll put the link up for the paper. It's a bit hard to find. It was published in a scientific paper last year and they put it all up on Figshare. They put up uh, five seasons of uh, one season of each of the major leagues. And so there is actually no real excuse not to have for event data. We're going to try and look a bit more at tracking data, but for event data, it's reasonably easy to get your hand on stuff. It might not be your favorite players just now, but it's, it's possible to get hold of that, those types of data to start playing around with. Um, now I've lost track of my list of questions. Uh, yeah, let, let's, because there is an interesting thing there, because when it comes, we've just been into this, you should get your data thing. And one thing we discussed when we met on Monday was to do with blogging. And just a quick answer, did any of you write blogs or were active in social media before you started your current jobs? No, not in my case, at least. I just, uh, I had Twitter as most of the people, but I didn't use it for posting anything related to yeah. statistics or football or anything like that. And it's been since I started working when I've been publishing some things, but uh, not very active there either. And certainly not anything related to blogging or writing in any other people blogs or anything like that, no. So I, I mean, and I think that's the same of all of you. I don't think anyone was really sort of very active. Suds got Twitter yesterday. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very active on, on Twitter, but I mean, I didn't get into my job doing that. I sort of got into Twitter through my, my job. And I think when you do this type of programming, I would say that you're really doing it for yourself a lot of the time. Of course, you can share it. I mean, I don't think I'm against sharing these types of things. But you've got to be motivated to do this type of programming yourself. Is there anyone who wants to say something about about that? Or, or um... about David well, about what sh the motivations and and how you uh, well, actually, you all seem to be not very. There isn't doesn't seem to be any kind of idea that you have to get things out in the public sphere first. It's more that you apply for the jobs and you get them. No, well, I think that uh, at least you have uh, at Opta Forum and Statsbaum Forum, uh, MIT Sloan, RR, Barcelona Conference, you have places that, uh, and, and also Nessis and Cassis, and I'm missing lots now, but there's uh, many conferences that are, that are actually, you know, focused on analytics in sports with different levels and different kinds of, of approaches. So. I do think it's interesting to at least try to develop, uh, you know, like a full work on that. I mean, not just, I mean, not when, when starting, it's good when starting to try to, you know, get things out and get it on Twitter and maybe in a, in a blog and try to get people to talk about that, but making the effort of trying to apply for an, uh, one of such conferences, if you already have more or less the technical skills to put things together, but you want to enter in sports because you have never done that before. I think it really pushes you to uh, to really think about the problem, to really when you when you write the results and conclusions and stuff, that you want to be sure that that's actually going to be true because then then you're probably going to get to present that, and then you're going to have lots of people with interest and probably or or, or surely with experience in that, going to criticize that. Um, that if if someone is in that middle 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 point in, in terms of starting to work in sports and, and and pushes that, I think it's a great opportunity that comes from when uh, from talking in conferences or being able to to present your work in some way because then you attract people uh, mm -hmm. that tells okay this guy talks about this I can just ask him about that and something I would li like to say, I don't, I don't know if it's part of this question, but I do think that, I mean, I always say that I never understood the idea of being part of a community in my life in terms of, uh, I, don't know, I really didn't know what that uh, meant, but then I saw the actual, uh, at least football and uh, analytics community, mm. which really interesting I mean, there's actually a group of people with the same interests as sharing things and and making things uh, together and trying to share when they can do it so uh if you start being part of that community you can give back when you get something back but you're also going to get from people that write to you or sends paper or sends for help or opportunities for collaborated and so on cool so i think i think the answer is that 
you don't need to blog in order to get these types of jobs. But certainly if you start to join in the community already, then it helps it helps you along the way. And I think one thing that that came up in our discussions afterwards uh, is that now data scientists are more established in teams that there's often like a three day interview process or something to get into these things where you have to do certain tasks and so on. Did any of you experience this on your way into football analytics? I know that you didn't, Suds, and Xavier, you got in quite early. Well, Fran, I know you're, so actually the question is just to Pascal. What was, what was the quality, how, how did you do the... Uh... Not a three-day uh, test, yeah. but a, a usual uh, application process with uh, several interviews, like for a normal job. Okay, that's what I. Would, had, yeah. would you do now if you were taking people in? Would you th consider the three-day method? Not really a three-day method, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> as 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 I had a usual application process, that's that's what I prefer. Okay. The the um, I mean, what, what we're what we're doing is we are conducting now the second hackathon, which is kind of a recruiting platform as well. So people are working on projects for months, and we talk with them, see what they're able to do, see how fast they can adjust their mindset to that specific domain of soccer, and and this is one one thing that helps us as well to evaluate potential. Uh, 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 yeah data scientists better yeah i think that's quite interesting because that's kind of related yeah. to that isn't it it's not a three-day thing but it's like yeah, yeah taking people in and and seeing that they they can do this and i think that's what a lot of sports clubs do not only soccer there is an nba hack challenge there was an nfl hack challenge there was a u.s soccer hackathon and, and that just makes sense because as, as you see here in the chat, people are asking for data access. And if you give them data access, they're happy to spend their time with those data because it's it's more interesting than maybe some production data or so. Mm. I believe uh, PSG is another club as well that hosts uh, yeah. yearly hackathons yeah. once a year. Um, and uh, I believe last year, the winner of the competition actually got a fully funded PhD or so something was fully funded. Mm -hmm. uh, there are clubs. That yeah, I, I think that's a very important way in, which is related to the whole blogosphere thing. I think the opt analytics conference is a very a good way into these types of things. Definitely. The stats bomb um, have these types of types of things. A lot of the people who've worked work for stats bomb have started that way. Yeah. And for all those people asking the questions, the Opta Pro Forum is every year in February. You'll get access mm -hmm. to data, you'll get a mentor. If you win, we can present. And I think all of the presenters from the past years got into some club afterwards. So there are a lot of cool chances, I'd say. Okay. Also, the thing about, uh, you know, if, if blogging or not, or, you know, how, how, how to get there. I mean, there's some idea that uh, I think that you can see it happening every time. I mean, in every place that is that, Basically, this is not a, like a fair uh, process or like sub world or industry in terms of it's not that you, that you do the degrees and then you apply to a job and then you get paid what uh, what you want to get paid and then you you know work eight hours uh, per day and then you have that job. It's I mean in in each of those things there are no no no's and different ways in uh, um, in the way of that happens. But the good thing is that. Uh, most people working on this, uh, on this is, is driven by motivation and really learn to uh, uh, trying to learn something. And what I, what I always like to think when we're trying to uh, work uh, or well, we're doing the work every day is we want to understand football better, and we are we are trying to model things in football because it's just we we get excited about saying oh now I'm I'm able to observe this tendency or evaluate or you know spot this pattern or tell something to someone that is an expert in football that might help him to think in you know, other 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 things and then apply that and if you're lucky you're going to see that materialize uh, on the field so it's just like um more or less vague motivation but it's interesting because it's just love for that sport and just making that uh, more uh, interesting and also what I like about football is more getting more um, you know peace and love way is that 
I do think that football uh, and sports in general are an amazing tool to get people uh, out of poverty and out of many uh, wrong places and really brings people right. together. And I always say that I have moved from city, I think four or five times in my life. And the first thing I have done the first day I get into a city is to you know find people to play football and then uh, you make friends instantly, right? So if, if that's not a proof that brings people together, that I cannot find a, any other. So if you can do that and think that that can touch people in, in some way, that, that's a good motivation because then the effort, the hours, the pay, the, the, the hard it is to actually provide something of value, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be tough and you need something to balance that out. Oh, I'm really feeling motivation and love for football now. That's really, that's really beautiful. <laughs> okay, that's I think that's what I think that's we've covered most of the questions there. I'm going back into my PowerPoint um, slide here. I, th I think we've covered them, and there are so many questions online. <laughs> uh, what I suggest is, and we've gone we've got half an hour over what we were going to do. What I suggest is we just um, and I I go to bed at ten o'clock, so. Uh, I have to start like winding down, but what I suggest is we just go offline for maybe two minutes, and each person just picks out a question that they'd really like to answer, and we go one at a time and go through those questions, maybe one or two questions that you'd really like to answer, and then we come back and do them. So we'll do that. So we'll just I'm just going to somehow um, going to put this streaming on pause. I don't know how to do that at all. Well, um, I, think, um, yeah. I could start with one question to bridge the time. Okay, we're going then, right? We're all, all going. So Pascal can start, and the rest of us can um, can look. I, I take the last question, which is what we're doing uh, within this kind of unplanned off season. One thing is we're doing YouTube live streams, uh, and I I think the other thing is. Um, for us, it's always hard to find a balance between um, daily business, a talk request from coaches and analysts that they really need, and long-term research projects. Because if you want to develop a, um, a, a really machine learning model that works, that takes time, and therefore it feels like winning a lot of time uh, for doing that stuff because the euros for us are delayed for one for one more year so there's always plenty of stuff to do and i would say I spend most of my time i won now with uh, uh long-term research projects cool okay who's who's up next then who thinks that they've got a uh, answer a question and answer yeah well, okay you you have a think i'll i'll take the um i'll take one thing that comes up has come up a lot in the end there and it's the python versus r debate which one should you learn <laughs> Um, so I had to, personally, I had to go, I used to use MATLAB, which was the older thing that shows my age. And I had to choose one of these recently and I ended up choosing Python. And I think mainly because it's a bit more of a programming language in some way, and that makes it more flexible. And so you can do a lot of the things in R where you can do everything in both languages. There's no doubt about that. But the, the data frame structure in Python is basically R. And then you can also program things in, in Python as well. And I think it's got a slight edge in football analytics over R. Somebody said that it was kind of maybe more, um, more in, in sports science that they used R and more in analytics they used Python. And that's probably a fair, fair reflection. Python is probably the one to go for. The data eight course that I uh, mentioned is is in uh, Python, and also a good resource, irrespective of if you're going to use Python or R, is the FC Python um, course. That's a really really nice introduction to basic plotting, basic use of data frames, and so on. So I, I thoroughly recommend that one. Um, good. So I'll uh, are you the rest of you ready. Yeah. I'll go for one. Um... I think uh, if someone wants to fast track the learning, learning the necessary math to get into football analytics, um, within the club, I think uh, to go back to what people have already said, it's really, you want to be able to show value quickly, um, especially if you're put into that position 
where uh, you're producing work for people that know their stuff, they know football, they know how to develop players, they know what performance means. Uh, so I think the necessary things, the minimum viable curriculum, I believe, um, would be to know linear mixed modeling or just linear modeling, linear mixed modeling, um, understanding how to do uh, significant samples. So if you want to understand uh, differences uh, between uh, the month of May, the month of, uh, sorry, month of May, month of October, month of November, uh, maybe between some positional groups, uh, it might be very helpful to learn how to do a significance testing with repeated measures. Um, and uh, I think also what's very important is linear algebra. I think it's probably the most important thing um, because a lot of the work that we can do is uh, done via matrix operations. Um, and I believe linear algebra would give the foundation for everything else. Um, now, uh, when it comes to modeling context in tactical analysis, you might need to go for a more nonlinear approach, but uh, I wouldn't yet consider that as a minimum viable curriculum. I think linear algebra and linear mixed modeling would uh, do the trick for you. Um, and again, in Python or R would be two good options. Cool. Um, yep. And I'll take, I'll take Fran then, yeah. Yep. I'll go, there was someone asking that he was uh, studying a master's degree now in the US and he had applied for several clubs in the Major League Soccer, but nothing had developed. Mm. And he was asking for advice about how to continue from that. And I would just say that as most of us or all of us said at the beginning that we're just working here because we were lucky, sort of. We weren't really expecting this. And it's, I mean, it's not an easy job to get, but I would tell him just to keep applying and keep working towards that. Maybe not, not as your first job, but maybe if you can go to these uh, Opta forums or get these hackathons, as Pascal was saying, that you might find up some opportunities that are there. It's just like, keep doing that if you like it and keep trying because uh, we're here just because we were in the right place in the right moment. So just doing that. Cool. Okay, and Javier, we'll give the final word to you then. Sure, uh, so I'm gonna, gonna mix, uh, I think two or, or three questions in one because I think they more or less come, come together. So uh, going back to what someone asked about what books to read and what basically what to read to get into this. Someone, sorry that I don't remember the, the names because the chat goes down and up too quickly. But then someone talked about defensive stats that want to get into that and how to, you know, to create those, those kind of stats and what can be a recommendation for that. He also mentioned about creating space and run and run behind the backs of the defensive line and so on. So I want to be brief on this is that uh, there's, there's an, an amazing, an amazingly great source where you can start uh, with that is all the papers that has been written on sports analytics so far and you, you can begin with football and then get to the other ones because being such a such a new uh you know track or area um there are not that many i mean there's lots of things but they're not that that many so i remember that I, I think it's a comment that uh, Luke Bourne did on Opta Forum two years ago that he said that uh, many people come to him saying that, oh, I have this uh, new idea. I want to do this in the sport. And the most common answer that he provided was read this paper and this one talks about this and read this paper and this other one that talks about the other, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think that there's great sources on those papers because depending on the conference journal or place, it's going to be... A, either more technical or more uh, practical uh, driven, but you're gonna see there what kind of data is being used, what kind of answers are being trying or being approached and what kind of um, you know, technical skills are being used to actually model those things. So not everything is sp um, spatial temporal modeling, but that will help. Not everything is tracking data, but that will help to provide context. Uh, there's many ways of that. So if you can, if there's someone you can do on that line is basically start reading every possible paper there is because I mean, it will be a fun uh, process and it's a great way of getting knowledge on that. And regarding the defensive stats, it's, 
I do think that defensive uh, information in general, uh, it's one of the less covered topics in analytics in sports so far, because it's, it's way complex. I mean, um, I always say that in football, we have this huge issue that is the only objective thing, the only that is thing that is 100% up objective that is scoring the goals uh, doesn't happen frequently, right? So in basketball, you can make use that points are being, or shots are being attended frequently and you have a lot of points, but in football, you don't have that. So when you go to defensive stats, uh, then you don't even have on ball events. You have, you might be evaluated for being, for doing something good when something doesn't happen, right? But even though there's lots of interesting things being done defensively on basketball, um, I think on hockey, there's a little bit on that. And regarding, for example, creating spaces, there's at least six or seven different models for pitch control or space creation and those things. So I do think there's great tools to start actually getting into that topic. And the, the, the awful truth is that the only way of, of doing that is start actually doing it, to read it and try to work on it. And it's, it's tough, but it's um, rewardful, I think. Cool. I just want to do one more thing because there's still quite a few questions coming in about where you get data um, and where the relevant papers are is just coming in. So where you get data, a few people are saying stats bomb. That's probably the leading place for, for free data if you don't want to scrape it very well organized and so on. Then I'm going to put the link up straight after I finish this for the Y Scout free data uh, place as well. Um, then papers, one thing that's really important, I think, coming more from a scientific background, is how you think about reading papers. So what you should do is you should start with Google Scholar. Go into yeah. Google Scholar, type whatever random thing that you typed into the chat just now that you're interested in defensive metrics in football, and one paper will come up. Start by looking through that, that you don't need to read that one in detail, but look also at the papers that it cites and the papers that cite it and go backwards and forwards and download, like spend an evening just downloading 50 yeah. papers of that type. Look how many times they've been cited because it often is, if we like it or not, often it is a measure of quality. And then try and work out what are the key ones here, which ones are the best written and so on. So a lot of those types of things can be done yourself just by well, by, by reading through Google Scholar. So go into Google Scholar and start there. And even just to add so, so, something quick on that, David, uh, even uh, instead of actually looking for keywords, if you look for Luke Bourne and Patrick Lucy and Jan van Hatten and a couple of more people. And yeah, type, that, type the names into the chat there, there Javier. Just, just looking at what those guys have published, yeah. uh, you probably have for, for two or, or three months of very intense reading, but they, they have been doing work for a long time now. And I, I think- Yeah, for, forget, forget the, the Google Scholar, just go to Luke Bourne's website, start oh, yeah. there <laughs> and work backwards. <laughs> no, but also, uh, as, as I was saying, Jan and Patrick Lucy, and uh, if, if you want to go about pitch control, also Will Spearman's model is, 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 is amazing because it's purely based on physics. I mean, there's a lot of very interesting things. And I think NFL people is doing amazing things, opening data and providing hackathons and stuff, if, if you like American football. So yeah, there, there's, we are starting to have some sources, not many, but yeah. That's great. God, there's so many interesting questions coming in there. For some reason it's looking at you, Suds, while I'm speaking. I think it's your... Um, but uh, there's so many interesting questions. I want, I want to answer the one about football manager. But this is just meant to be a start. We're now 45 minutes over what we said we'd, we'd do. Um, I haven't got to show much of my PowerPoint presentation. So maybe I can just show this right at the end. Um, it's not going to be too spectacular. <laughs> but it's going to be basically... I've already penciled it in that next time, Thursday, um, 2nd of April, we're going to do this. And next time, instead of focusing on our jobs and what skills are needed, we're actually going to think about these things like defensive metrics and so on. What would you like us to have as content in the course? And if we don't know enough about it, then we'll get someone else to talk about it. And 
we're also going to address this question a bit more of, of data and how we might make data available and so on. So um, I think I'll just say uh, thank you very much for, from all of us. Well, please all feel free to say thank you and, and uh, goodbye. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think that this first time was just we trying to put together the kind of ideas we have. Uh, I think David, David said well in the beginning that we're going to try to be more specific in the next uh, in, in the next sessions and also in the in the in the, in the seminars that are going to be uploaded. And I love, I mean, the, the amazing amount of questions and ideas we have uh, be, that have been written in the chat, uh, which provides you, yeah, a good um, starting point of what's what can be interesting. I don't know how can we filter all of this now, uh, but there are ideas that we want to take forward. Such, I mean, I think Pascal mentioned it a little bit that is about creating standards and so one one thing we have been planning to do but we haven't had the time to do it yet is actually writing down all these papers all these sources uh by topics and, and yeah. publishing that into a github repo and so things so um if if you are interested in that and you actually want to help uh, in that process we are 100% walk. I mean, this is not a closed group. It's actually like an open yeah. thing to actually you know, bring the community together. Yeah. yeah. Lovely. Yep. I'd like to say thank you for everyone that uh, came. And uh, I think the questions gave us a very good starting point for us to um, make a few videos, uh, pre recorded videos, upload them, uh, see if they have some traction, and uh, fill in the missing gaps with uh, whatever questions that you guys have next. Um, I'm going to echo what Javier said. I believe this is a very organic and open community. Um, and the goal is, is that probably by working in the club, we have so much to do on a daily basis that this is probably the best way for us to produce content and a way to give back. Um, so your participation is just going to make this uh, amazing. And uh, thank you for your presence. Yeah, cool. from my side, like, just thank you for being there. And if you have any topics that you want us to talk about, just leave it in the comments now or we'll have a look at them afterwards. And uh, I think that we'll be here for many weeks, hopefully, until this uh, situation ends. And well, maybe longer, we'll see. But yeah, thanks everybody for being there. And Pascal. There's nothing to add. Thanks and stay healthy to everybody. Yeah. wherever you are in the world <laughs> yeah stay healthy okay great signing off for here thank you very much bye thanks bye bye, bye.